Peter chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its challenge. We thank you, God, that you speak to us through your word. And we pray, God, that you would help us to listen and to be obedient. We pray for each and every soul here, Lord, that seeds would be planted and that they would grow as you water them, Lord, and draw each and every one of us closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Last spring, in my job at the school, we were asked to take an aptitude test, if you will, something to that effect. Maybe some of you have had, in, in the course of your professional careers, to take some type of test or survey or examination where the end result was supposed to tell you a little bit about yourself that maybe you didn't quite realize. Um, and I've, I've taken several over the years. This one was called Strength Finders. And after you took the, the survey and you got your results back, and then we met and w- with other teachers, and there was a person there who was trained to interpret our results. And anyway, it, you, know, it come to, you come to find out things about your personality, things about your skills and ability, characteristics, if you will, of, of, of you, of what you're like and, and what other people see in you. And some of the things, with all these different tests that I've took, some of the things, you know, they, they hit the nail right on the head. And there might be some things that I'm not always willing to admit, but it was right. Other things, I, I'm not so sure if the test was correct or not, you know, because it all, it all depends on how you respond and that sort of thing. Uh, but nevertheless, if you've experienced something like this, uh, you do it to kind of learn more about yourself and to be able to identify things that mark your personality, characteristics of who you are. Oh, it might say you're artistic, or maybe you have leadership ability, or maybe you're a good listener, maybe you're an encourager. It's things like that a lot of times. But it's supposed to be designed for you to help you know who you are, know what your strengths are, so that you can build upon those and just get better and better and better. Well, in the Word of God, there's a lot of different passages where the Lord is telling us who we are. Oh, not so much as as individuals, our aptitudes, but who we are as Christians, who we are as brothers and sisters in Christ. And the unfortunate things is that although we've read some of these passages and we've heard messages and lessons and things like that on them, we don't always embrace these things, especially when we're going through difficult times. But mark my word, Jesus Christ has given us victory. 
If you don't take anything else out of this sermon today, know that Jesus Christ has given us victory. Sometimes we don't live victoriously. Sometimes, in fact, we live defeated lives. But the more we read the Word of God, and the more we pray on it, and the more we understand who we are in Jesus Christ, the more victorious of a life we can live. And how that light shines through us when people see us walking in victory. Not in pride, but in victory to know that God has delivered us from so much already and we trust that He's going to continue to deliver us. If not in this world, in the world to come, that is the victorious living in Christ that I'm speaking about. So it's important for us to know who we are in Jesus Christ. It's important for us to know what He is calling us to do. And passages like this one give us some pretty good clues. Now, in this particular passage, Peter is telling the people that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the house of God. He's saying, now this cornerstone causes some people to stumble. In fact, it says that some people stumble over the word. It is offensive to them. Verse 8 says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, be in disobedience. But then it says, But you are a chosen generation. And in that reference, generation means group of people. There are those that stumble at the word of God. There are those that are offended by the cross in Jesus Christ. But you, but I, but those that name the name of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. We, as the church, are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That is who we are in Jesus Christ. And it becomes difficult sometimes to identify ourselves with this when we're being mocked and persecuted and put down, whether it be at the workplace, whether it be in the neighborhood, when we're trying to live righteously, when we're trying to swim against the stream, when we're not just willing just to flow along with whatever whims the culture is moving on, but we're willing to take a stand and say, this isn't what my Lord wants me to do. When we're being ridiculed from TV show after TV show, news report after news report, look at those Christians. It's not always easy. And it wasn't easy for people back in Peter's day. And they were really swimming against the stream. Not only was it difficult for them because of all of the paganism going on around them, but even in the Jewish community, being a Christian was swimming against the stream. Christians were persecuted. Christians were called blasphemers. It wasn't always popular. And it isn't today. But that's where that victorious living in Jesus Christ comes and helps us and pushes us and sustains us and gets us through to understand that yes we are different and that is what God has called us to be now have you ever been called peculiar before that's not always a flattery <laughs> if you've ever been called peculiar you might have a friend at work that always has to have their desk in a certain way and if you move their stapler, they go crazy. That, you say, well, that person's kind of peculiar over her stapler, okay? Or you, got, you have a neighbor that has to have the yard. I used, my uncle um, uh, that lives in Virginia, he was very peculiar over his grass. It had to be an exact height and the minute one blade of grass got higher than that, he was cutting it. He wouldn't let nobody cut his grass. He, he was very peculiar. So a lot of times when we think of the word peculiar, that's kind of what we think of as someone that's very, very particular. So you may not always find it as a term of endearment to be called peculiar. But in the sense of being a child of God, you know what? I'm perfectly okay with being called a peculiar person because that means that I am different or at least I'm called to be different than everything else that's going on around me. And yes, that is what you as a Christian are being called to do, to be a peculiar people, to be a peculiar person, to be different 
to stand out than, from other people around you that aren't doing what God would have them to do. I think of, I'm so inspired that even in the schools today, even in the high schools, there are some children that stand out because of their goodness. There are some teachers that stand out because of their righteousness. There are some people in the community that stand out because they have the Holy Spirit of God and there's something different about them. We should admire them. We should try to emulate them. We should try to be who God has called us to be. But it is not always easy. And that's why Jesus time and time again gives us examples of what we're supposed to do, what the right thing is. And he tells us it's not going to be easy. He told his disciples that night of the Last Supper in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world and I'm passing my victory on to you. Now, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, meaning we're supposed to stand out and help show people the way. Lights are bright. Lights stand out in the midst of darkness. You know, sometimes I'll, uh, after the kids have been to bed for about an hour or so and I'm finishing up my stuff and I'll peek in on them just to kind of see what they're doing. And sometimes little buddy's got a little screen and I can see that light and I'm like, buddy, go to bed, you know, because that light. That little screen, that little tablet or whatever he's got stands out. You know, in and, and our day it was taking a flashlight looking at a magazine, but they don't need that stuff anymore. They got everything on their tablets and phones or whatever they're having, their iPods. So that little light stands out. So the point is, you know, light is supposed to stand out, right? Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are a city on the hill. A city on the hill and the light of the world, that tells me that I'm not supposed to just be held up somewhere where nobody can see what's going on. No, we're supposed to be there as God's people to help direct and move, give an example. He also says, you are the salt of the earth. And back in those days before refrigeration and that sort of thing, yes, salt gave flavor to the world, but what else did salt do? It helped preserve the meat. Some of you, have you guys, anybody ever here ever cured ham and stuff like that? And you know, you put heavy salts on it and stuff like that to help it preserve. You know, that's what we as Christians are called to do. Yes, we give, I think we give flavor to the world, but we're also there to help preserve the world from decay. And so we stand out. We're different. Where everything might be bland, if you put a little salt on that food, all of a sudden it, it, that salt stands out, that salty taste. And that's what we're called to do. And so we can, we, you can speak in terms of standing out and, and adding flavor and preserving and being a light, that sort of thing. But do we really understand what that means? Do we understand how that is applied to our daily walk? Well, Jesus knew we would have some trouble with this, so he gave us some examples. And he said on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, everybody says that you ought to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but I say, love your enemy too and pray for him. That is how you stand out. That is how you are peculiar because everybody else says, well, if you like me and you're doing good stuff to me and you're helping me out, I'll love you. I'll give you everything I got. But if you cross me, I'm done. I don't want nothing else to do with you. I hate you. That's what everybody does. That's human nature. But if he's called us to be peculiar people, then we got to go a step further and say, you know what? I don't hate you. I may be upset with what you've done to me, but I am willing to forgive you. And I am going to love you despite it. That's different. It's not easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy. But I'm saying that's the peculiar, can I say this word, peculiarity? Hard word for me to say. That's how particular Christ wants us to be. And he's given us a great example of that because every time we sin, every time we do wrong, every lie that we tell, every lustful lie, every, every idle word, all of these things that are offensive to God, God could have easily just done away with us. We could have been enemies of God. He could have said, huh, I've given you your chance. You're done. You're gone. But what does he do? 
He becomes flesh. He goes to the cross so that we could be forgiven. And he's saying, if I can give my only begotten son for you who have done nothing just about your entire life but moved away from me and sinned and violated my law, I expect when I forgive you that you in turn can forgive others because I'm calling you to be peculiar, calling you to be distinguished and different than others who don't know me yet. He gives us another example when he says, if a man sues you and asks for your coat, give him your cloak also. And he says, if a, male, a man compels you to go a mile, go two miles. Why? Because that's different. That's peculiar. And that shows more love. So we look at distinguishing marks, characteristics of Christians. One that you may not initially agree with or like to think about, but one particular mark is being peculiar, being different, being salt, being light, loving till it hurts. In that old song or something, love till it hurts. Christ has loved till it hurt. And it hurt not just in his body, but all of that sin he experienced on the cross, all of our sin, all of that shame, all of that, that torture that he endured, it hurt. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God. So it wasn't just the nails it wasn't just a crown of thorns. It wasn't just the slashes on his back. It wasn't just the pain of hanging suspended in the air on that cross. But it was the pain and sting of sin. And he closed his eyes. He said, it is finished. And he took that sin to the grave. And then, out of his love, on that third day, Stone is rolled back, and here comes Jesus saying that now sin is done away with, and I have overcome death, and all who believe in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he's saying, follow me. Learn from me. Use me as an example for I've called you to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood by which you have access to the Father, a holy nation of people, peculiar, different, adding flavor and giving light. And we think about this text, you know, there's a lot of different directions that we could go thinking about these things. And for some people, it's really challenging to continue to remain different. And I know you've heard sermons and things like that saying that there's more of the world in the church now than the church in the world, things like that. But it is a challenge for the church to continue to be different. You know, some people might think we're peculiar just because we do come here. Some people are saying, why are you wasting your time? My grandma did that years ago and, you know, nothing ever came of it. Why are you going away? You could be, you could be out on your boat. You could be in... Uh, playground somewhere you could be at a movie you could be at a store why are you why are you going every Sunday well we're peculiar we're peculiar that way we're funny that way but it's a challenge for the church to remain different it's a challenge for the church not to compromise it's a challenge for us in our workplaces and our communities to be different it's a challenge but that's what we're called to be and for others this morning maybe this text this passage, the word of the Lord today, is calling us to repent where we have compromised, where we have let our light become dull, where we have kind of given in to the pressures of persecution and mockery, and we were just content for our faith, our religion, just to kind of be private. Maybe we need to repent of this and do what Jesus has called us to do, to let our light shine.
So just some things to think about this morning. But remember, you are victorious in Christ. You are chosen. You are special. And I pray that you would be peculiar. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful today for your word. God, you have called us to be different, just like you called the nation of Israel to be different. To stand out among the nations. Not in a prideful way, but in a way that is an example to others. God, we just pray that we would so let our light shine before men that they would see our good works and glorify you in heaven. And through our lives, through our testimonies, Lord, we pray that we can help bring others to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.